Well, hello everyone. It's really good to be back. We had a great time in Houston for the uh, regional family weekend, Gabriel and I, and uh, really enjoyed ourselves there, but it's always nice to be home. So, uh, happy Sabbath. Good to see you. <clears throat> uh, the title of today's message is Understanding the New Year, a Resolution. Do you find yourself looking forward to the transition from one year to the next? Did you find yourself feeling this way as we transitioned from 2013 to 2014? What about celebrations with friends where nobody got drunk or entered into any other type of obvious sinfulness? What about setting aside a time to enjoy the fireworks sponsored by your local community. Oh, and what could be so bad about making a New Year's resolution to overcome something or achieve something? One meaning for resolution, as defined by Google, is a firm decision to do or not to do something. So when somebody tells you of their New Year's resolution, they will express to you a firm decision to do or not do something within the upcoming Roman calendar year. They are using the transition from December to January as a reasonable, in their mind, demarcation for making a change in their life. Unlike holidays such as Easter and Christmas, most modern-day Christians make no effort to associate the transition from one year to the next as to worshiping God. So, in some respects, the celebrations surrounding the change from one year to the next might seem rather innocuous. In other words, harmless or innocent. You know, I really like fireworks. I love fireworks. And one of the only couple times a year that we can do it is at New Year's. So, is that all right? With these questions and comments in mind today, I've made a resolution today to do what I can to reinforce or enlighten your understanding and mine about the Roman New Year. This is from, uh, I'm going to read a an excerpt from a book written by a Mr. John Bellamy. Second edition was published in 1813 and the name of the book was The History of All Religions. And I was enlightened by some of the research I found. From pages 97 and 98 of that particular edition, it appears evident that the Saturn of the heathen was Noah. Saturn was called by them the father of all, a preacher of righteousness, that under Saturn all things were each other's in common, that under Saturn's reign all was peace. It was therefore termed the golden age, that all men used one speech. The wife of Saturn was called Rhea, R-H-E-A, or earth. Noah was called a man of the earth, or a husbandman. Saturn is said to be a planter of vines, as Noah planted a vineyard. It is recorded of Saturn that he drank the juice of the grapes and, he, and was drunken, that he was the author of a law which forbade the gods to behold the nakedness of men, alluding to the crime of Ham. If you'll remember, Ham saw Noah naked and he didn't cover him. Saturn is said to have arisen from his wife, I mean with his wife and children from the sea. Like Noah after the deluge, a ship was one of the symbols of Saturn in which he sailed about the world. Saturn, like Noah, foretold Deucalion's flood. Saturn is said to have devoured his own children except three, Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto, which alludes to Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Saturn and his three sons divided the world. The same is said of Noah. 
Janus, J-A-N-U-S, as well as Saturn, in the mythology, without doubt, refers to Noah. The Latins appear to have derived it from J-A-I-N, meaning wine, adding the masculine termination U-S, which makes J-A-I-N-U-S, or J-A-N-U-S, a door or entrance. A name very proper for Noah, who on his entrance into the new world, when he descended from the ark, was the first who planted the vine. I don't know if y'all will recall commercials or maybe you even use the investor. There's an investment fund called Janus Fund, and their symbol is a two-headed bust looking both directions. Looks like if I go down to pages 117 to 119, I'm going to pull some things from there. The worship of the ancient Romans was in its origin much the same as that of the ancient Grecians. For they believed that Jupiter, i.e. Jeho Pater, or Jehovah the Father, as above, was the supreme of all the gods. Like the Greeks, to him they assigned all the attributes of the God of Heaven. But to their subordinate gods or rulers, they assigned a dominion only over certain things. So we're now talking about the, the uh, Romans as opposed to the Grecians. Mr. Bellamy then goes on to describe the different subordinate gods, and, he, and I'm going to single out one of them. These subordinate gods in their origin were only men who had the government or chief management of all those departments of the state signified by the name of so given. He then goes on to describe Janus because he is presumed to attend particularly to the encouragement of husbandry. This latter was strikingly significant for at the beginning of the year he is described with two faces. With one on the first of January which comes from Janus. January is named after Janus. He looked forward to the new year, while at the same time he looked back with the other face on the good or bad management of the agriculture of the old year. They therefore symbolically prefigured him with a second face at the back of the head. From U.S. News and World Report, an article was written in December 23rd of 1996. And I will just read some parts of it related to the New Year celebration or the de demarcation of the new Roman New Year. In 46 BCE, the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar first established January 1st as New Year's Day. Caesar celebrated the first January 1st New Year by ordering the violent routing of revolutionary Jewish forces in Galilee. Now I got this, uh, like I said, from this article which was posted by a Christian Hebrew website, re reposted by them. So, uh, so Caesar had the Jewish forces uh, routed. Eyewitnesses say blood flowed in the streets. In later years, Roman pagans observed the new year by engaging in drunken orgies. A ritual they believed constituted a personal reenacting of the chaotic world that existed before the cosmos was ordered by the gods. And then I'll drop down. Throughout the medieval and post-medieval periods, January 1st, supposedly the day on which Jesus' circumcision initiated the reign of Christianity and the death of Judaism, was reserved for anti-Jewish activities, synagogue and book burnings, public tortures, and simple murder. There are things about its history that are, uh, well, I didn't know them until I looked into it. And uh, obviously, as with many of the holidays Americans keep today, we don't really think about where they come from and what their history is. So if we assume that the sources I have given you have veracity that are true, a published book and a published article from a major magazine, we quickly find the pagan origins of New Year's Eve and the celebrations surrounding it, possibly even the exaltation of Noah to that of a god. 
but my local community does not use it to commemorate or artificially designate a day towards Jesus' circumcision, and I don't want to use it to persecute anybody personally. I also have no intention of getting drunk or loose in my ways because it's January 1st. So what's so bad about being happy that the day length has started to increase again? Inviting the return of spring. Why not resolve to lose weight, feed the needy, buy a car, or visit Timbuktu before the next year's end? Well, as with any day which has origins in pagan worship, these days are historically considered holy to men, devised by men, though that holiness, again, is designated by them and not God. If you'll turn to Deuteronomy in chapter 12, we'll turn to a fairly familiar scripture to most people. Deuteronomy chapter 12, and we'll read in verse 29. Chapter 12. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. Verse 31, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Verse 32, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. We also have one other glaring fact about the new year. Keeping the previous scripture in mind, God did give instruction in the Bible about a new year. We can turn to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. Exodus chapter 12. And in verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. This month that was spoken of was right at the Passover season. It was, is most commonly called a bib or Nisan, Nisan like the truck. <laughs> Um, but there's a number of Jewish names given to it depending on the symbolism they are uh, providing for it. But it does, it is the very first month of the holy year. In 2014, that first day of this month begins the evening before April 1st. And then two weeks later, we have Passover. So God instructed Moses and Israel in calling this the first month. Then God instructs on how to prepare and sacrifice the Passover lamb, as well as when and how to keep the days of unleavened bread in this very same month. Uh, there is a, I found another website. It's entitled Hebrews, Hebrew for Christians. Uh, and they had, they, this is like Jewish wisdom from the Jewish sages, so I'm not trying to suggest that we turn to them for guidance on holy matters, on uh, understanding our relationship with Jesus Christ, but it was an interesting uh, uh, paragraph that I want to share with you. Rebirth of creation. According to the sages, there are two orders of creation, the natural and the supernatural. The natural order of creation refers to the physical creation of the heavens and creation uh, of the heavens and the earth, whereas the supernatural refers to spiritual recreation or rebirth. On the Jewish calendar, the natural order of creation is celebrated during Rosh Hashanah i.e. Tishri 1, 
So in the fall festival time is when that is kept. Whereas the supernatural is celebrated on Rosh Kodashim, or Chodashim, which I think is another name for uh, that month, Nisan 1. Uh, you know, our understanding of God's plan for man through the holy days is a what? It's a spiritual plan. It's showing how God is going to change us into His children. And He starts that process in that first month with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so that we can be forgiven, that the door can be opened for forgiveness of sin. And then you have the Days of Unleavened Bread where we are to choose to turn from sin and follow God, put sin out of our lives. And you know that, you know, in my mind, that happens before we're baptized. You have to make that decision. You have to repent, and then we, you know, later on in the season, we have Pentecost. I'm, yeah. So uh, the bad thing about making notes is if you re start talking about your notes and not reading them, then you don't know where to start. Go back. So I realize that there's nothing wrong with resolving to do or not do something. <coughs> I realize that fireworks are fun. At least they are for me. So. And I realize that it's comforting to know the sun will rise again. Uh, but you and I are called to live a life of daily resolution to let Christ live in us when we are baptized. It no longer, you know, talk about resolutions. That resolution is a daily adventure. Every day we resolve to follow Christ and to overcome and to change and to grow. And it would be a really sad thing for me to, you know, hey, okay, I'm going through the year. I won't think about that too much because I know in the spring I'll just bear down and I'll start really trying to serve God. I'll resolve. We've got to resolve every day, no matter what day it is, no matter what year it is. So in closing, let us resolve daily to worship God in spirit and truth, appreciating God's design for the seventh day of the week and the holy days as demarcated by God's calendar months.